Thank you so much. Come on up, gentlemen. I, I like having people in uniforms around me. <laughs> feel safer. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, well, thank you all for showing up. Um, this is really important. Um, my name is Mark Desonier. I'm a member of the United States House of Representatives. I represent the 11th Congressional District in California. Uh, it is all in Contra Costa County. And for purposes of my involvement here today and in the last two years, um, as many of you know, I've been involved in transportation here in the Bay Area at the local, state, and the federal level, and I'm a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So um, the system worked because uh, a couple of reporters uh, called me and said, you've been involved in transportation after the Air Canada incident, uh, Matthias um, and Dan Bornstein, charming editor of the East Bay uh, Times editorial page. Um, they asked me what I was going to do, and we got very engaged, and then with Captain Sullenberger and with Kappa uh, and with multiple other folks um, have worked on this work product that you see in front of us today that we just introduced. I do want to say that there's been much work besides just this piece of legislation that we are hoping to move through the Congress. Um, SFO has implemented its own um, improvements since the incident, um, and then in the federal aviation uh, uh, authorization, we were able to get four amendments, my office, into that um, that anticipated a lot of the discussion we were having with the NTSB. And I want to thank the NTSB and particularly the chair as well. Uh, part of the discussion that we had was how do we change um, some of the culture at NTSB so they're more proactive. They do a terrific job after uh, incidents when uh, there have been injuries and death, uh, but more and more um, we want them, and they've been very good about this, about uh, anticipating and looking at near misses. So I do want to say um, a lot of my involvement in this came from um, 20 years ago when I was a county supervisor and an air quality regulator when the refineries in Contra Costa were having a historic run of um, accidents and inc incidents, including loss of life, that we went into there and had a long discussion about uh, near misses and human factors. And Captain Sullenberger will speak to this uh, more, but we know now and more and more in the laboratories doing great research, the national labs, on human factors in neuroscience in different fields, the healthcare field, in aviation, um, in chemical and refinery plants, and transportation, that as we understand how the brain works and how people retain information and make sure that they're constantly doing what we know are the best practices, I, for me, are really a crucial part of the whole discussion and what's in this piece of legislation. Just briefly, as you look at the legislation, um, there's a desire to make sure that we have the best technology. So what happened over two years ago here, um, that the pilots are better informed and the air traffic controllers are better informed. I want to thank the air traffic controllers here um, and in DC for showing me what happened that night um, from their perspective. Uh, one of the things that SFO has done is to make sure that there's always two people. Uh, when this incident happened, that actually one of the air traffic controllers had gone on a break, uh, so that won't happen again. And then the technology of making sure um, that you, you're actually using your technology when you're doing a landing is at least a backup, but also looking at new best available technology so both the air traffic controllers and the pilots will hear if they're lined up incorrectly as happened that night. And then as I said before, the human factors part of, of the legislation. And lastly, um, and I really want to thank the pilots for working with us. Kappa, who is represented here today, represents 30,000 uh, pilots. Um, and we've spent hours working with uh, the various pilot associations and others. Uh, the cockpit re voice recorders are a very difficult issue to work with uh, based on their history and unfortunately some things that happen internationally. Uh, so part of our, this bill, the last part, is to have the G GAO look at some of the challenges we've had as we've worked through that to make sure that the pilots are protected um, for, I mean, particularly from international governments who might misuse that information um, directed at them personally and having that available so it doesn't get recorded over and we have it for the experts at the end. And I think that covers everything for me. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And with that, um, really want to, what good fortune it is um, for the people who were on that flight that day to have had Captain Sullenberg there. But what good fortune we have here in the Bay Area to have him um, as a residence. 
resident and uh, uh, what a good fortune it is for America to have him and not just his expert, uh, his expertise um, in flying aircraft and, and, and doing it in a very responsible way and his talents, but also his commitment to aviation safety, which we couldn't have gotten this bill to this point without his contribution. So with that, Captain Selfie. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here with fellow pilots, practitioners, and safety mat uh, matter experts. And it's my honor to help uh, introduce this uh, Safe Landings Act with Congressman Desanya. Like he said, for over two years, he's been meeting with uh, people, 60 meetings, subject matter experts, to try to move the needle forward. The Safe Landing Act is good news for everyone who flies. As you know, Accidents are almost never the result of a single fault, a single failure, or a single error. Instead, they are the end result of a causal chain of events. And we have made, by studying accidents that have occurred and learning all the lessons from them, aviation now ultra safe. But we run the risk of being the victims of our own success if we don't keep on learning and growing and begin to more proactively address risk before they can lead to harm. We have made aviation safe enough that we can no longer define safety solely as the absence of accidents. We must do more than that. We must work harder than that. We must be more proactive than that. We must investigate incidents that are serious incidents. And instead of doing a post-mortem after an accident to identify accident causes and remedy them, we must look for precursor incidents and risks systemic failures and address them before they can hurt someone. Human factors is a big part of the Safe Landings Act. I'm a big believer in understanding completely how, how we design all our parts of the aviation system, the aircraft and equipment designs, the policies, the procedures that airlines use, the training that pilots and other aviation professionals get. All those together determine three things. How many errors are going to be made in our aviation system? What kinds of errors they will be and how consequential they will become? The better we design our systems, the more effective the safety cultures each organization have, the better we arm each pilot, each flight attendant, each mechanic and other aviation professionals with the skills, the knowledge, the tools to face the unknown, the safer we'll all be. So the reason we're here is ultimately because of not only Air Canada 759 two years ago, but because we feel an, an ultimate moral obligation that I want to remind everyone in aviation they should also feel and act on. Every airline executive, every regulator who oversees aviation, every lawmaker who oversees aviation should feel and act on this same moral obligation, this same professional obligation that aviation professionals feel. So it's my honor to be here today and, and take your questions as well. Thank you. I want to, one last thing um, that times up well with this is one of the amendments we got in the, we were able to successfully get in the federal aviation reauthorization was a GAO audit of these runway incursions, which uh, as you have in your background, have gone up um, because of volume and other things. So we expect that report to come back in the next, uh, before the end of the year, which will be part of the legislative process. So that'll inform some of the decision making when they come back. So with that, happy to try to answer any questions. Well, I, I do want to ask you, um, why do you think Boston Health is part of this, or, or, or did it get the role, and you know, why it's so important to you? Well, I have uh, been a part of aviation now for just over 52 years since I learned to fly. And for at least 40 of that, I've been a pilot's union safety advocate, uh, safety volunteer, safety committee member, and accident investigator for the pilot's union. So I'm one of the, the few people on the planet who's had, let's say, the opportunity to, to be on both sides of the investigation, now having had one of my flights be under the microscope for almost a year and a half, where their, the investigator's job is to follow the truth wherever it leads and discover the causes and begin to make important safety recommendations for safety improvements going forward. Now, there's still too many in the industry who, who view new safety initiatives 
as only a cost or a burden. And so I'm trying to remind everyone, even though it may not be taught in our business schools, what a strong business case there is in safety critical domains like medicine, like aviation, like energy and others for safety and quality, that in anything but the shortest term, quality and safety pay for themselves. As one of my Air Force Academy classmates who was a Air, uh, space shuttle commander told two NASA administrators, when it comes to costs, nothing is more expensive than an accident. And so of course, because of the famous flight 10 years ago that, that, uh, that as I now say, um, made me temporarily at least the de facto spokesperson for part of my profession. Uh, I feel I have an obligation to use this bully pulpit for good, to be an effective advocate for the safety of the traveling public. I owe it to those still flying who face these daily challenges to, uh, to speak up for them because I have a greater voice now to care about things, to, to speak about things I've cared about my whole professional life. That depends upon you and the American public. If this bill gets the notice it deserves, because it is a landmark bill, that goes a long way toward fulfilling what's essentially a tacit promise that every aviation company, every airline, every aviation professional makes to all their future passengers. Uh, when, when one enter, enters this noble profession of piloting, that's what we essentially do. They make a tacit promise to all their future passengers that they will do the very best they can do, the very best they know how to do to keep them safe. And so um, I, I think if we get the word out and if through calls to their representatives in the Congress and to FAA and the Department of Transportation and the White House, if they make it clear that this is something the American people know that they need that they want, then it will pass. And I'm, I'm confident that if the word gets out, um, that that will happen. I think uh, that the biggest threats are runway related. Uh, after, after we picked much of the low hanging fruit for decades, we no longer have many accidents that are caused by an engine failure and takeoff or by a wind shear. Uh, we still have too many uh, controlled flight into terrain collisions uh, with the ground off airport. Uh, but runway incursions, uh, wrong surface, uh, takeoffs and landings are still a great concern. Uh, and so we need to give pilots and crews the technology they need, the information they need. Uh, we need to formalize the best practices from across the industry to make sure that on every visual approach, if an instrument approach, if there's electronic guidance available, it's monitored as backup for what we think we're seeing out the window, especially at night or in inclement weather. It begins to address all those issues. This bill specifically asks that there be alerts made available in technology to air traffic controllers to warn them if, an, if a flight's not aligned to the correct runway, that there be a cockpit alert to warn the pilots in the cockpit if they are not aligned with the proper landing surface. Um, and there is a provision in the bill that would have the uh, FAA survey airline operators uh, to look for the best practices about what requirements they have that pilots use electronic guidance as a backup for visual approaches and then provide guidance so that all operators have uh, a formalized best practice in place. So again, it's a matter of filling in gaps, uh, correcting flaws in our safety system our layers of safety, the safety net that we have to have in place to make this system ro re robust and resilient enough to tolerate, correct the inevitable errors that will occur um, so that passengers and crews can be kept safe on every flight 
every day, every week, every month, every year. And, and that's a hard thing to do. We make it look easy. These gentlemen and their colleagues make it look easy, but it's not. It's hard to ensure that best practices are adhered to on every flight, every day, every week, every month, every year for decades. Now, if I could just, um, I think the balance is here is, is not to uh, alarm people. As Sully has said, we've got a very safe system. Uh, but to answer your question, from my perspective, it's um, not worrying about complacency, as Sully said, that we've got a good system. But that means we should constantly be vigilant to make it better. And this is true for the aviation industry, the refinery and chemical industry, the healthcare industry. Um, and that combined, I think, is a sort of a, a transformational time as we get technology and how it is implemented um, to the human factors. So looking at that always. And then lastly, um, there's a lot of pressure on, on publicly traded corporations to make more money. Uh, there is pressure from um, shareholder liability. So I get concerned in all of these instances. Uh, there's some very good people running these companies, but the legal structure right now uh, puts in the financial markets, put more and more pressure for ever greater return on profit. Nothing wrong with that as long as it's balanced with safety. Um, and that's really important. Um, and I'm hoping that as a result of today, uh, we will have more fruitful discussions with some of those business interests as they hopefully realize that it's in their best interest as well to perhaps incur some costs. Um, but that investment, as Sully just so eloquently put, is, is the best possible return on investment. Yes, um, I think we can, th but this is part of the key to all this is, is constantly looking at the policy and the regulation to make it effective, to make it effective in the environment we're in. So as it changes, you have to constantly look at that. And we know this now, as I said, the national laboratories are doing a lot of research, a lot of research facilities on the evolution of neuroscience and, and, and technology. So I think this could be a real model uh, for many industries because the aviation industry has done such a good job um, and that intersection. But that intersection also for political um, full disclosure is overlaid with the relationship with uh, publicly traded companies um, and the policymakers. So this is an opportunity, I think, to, to do a lot of good in, a, in many different instances. I think it is surprising to a lot of people. Uh, it's not required at every airline that that be done. Uh, it's certainly a, a good practice that captains would want to consider for a visual approach, uh, especially if it's an airport they haven't been to a lot, uh, if uh, there are other, you know, as you said, complicating factors. So we're, we're, we're uh, suggesting that the FAA look at industries, uh, at the industry standards, find the best practices and begin making you know, recommendations, guidance about what all cop operators should use as, as a backup. Again, it's about having more layers in the safety net. It's about looking at you know, predictable risks, things that have happened before in incidents and accidents, and having in place you know, backups and checks and, and, and checks and balances to make sure that errors are caught and corrected early on before they can lead to harm. That is a concern. That's a, a global concern, you know, literally and figuratively. Um, as, the, as the aviation industry becomes more global, as it continues to grow rapidly, it's important that we not take our eye off the ball. It's important that we have systems in place that will mitigate risk. So we have to do, I think, a better job of holistically looking at entire aircraft designs from start to finish and looking at risks, not just individually, but in combination, uh, seeing where the failure paths are and the effects that they will have, and making designs more rigorous, more robust, especially when it comes to uh, technology in the cockpit, 
We need to have more designs that are um, that have integrity, reliability, and redundancy built in. I'm, I'm encouraged that in the case of the Boeing 737 MAX, now I understand that they're considering using both flight control computers on every flight and not alternating the use of one and then the other from flight to flight. Again, a uh, source of more redundancy. So we need to look at our whole system from start to finish and look for those risks proactively and not just do a, a post-mortem after an accident. That's, that's really the point of this whole thing. And it's not just a design, this bill isn't just designed to, to rectify some of the risks identified in the Air Canada 759 act, uh, incident two years ago. This, all, uh, this also requires that more maintenance failure reporting be done, which is especially important as more and more airline maintenance continues to be outsourced to foreign maintenance repair organizations where oversight is diff more difficult and, and it quite frankly is not done as well or as often. Uh, it looks at other areas. Uh, a, a large amount of uh, resources are, are going to be to, to, uh, attributed to human factors research and not just for pilots but for mechanics and others to see where the, the human error occurs under what conditions and to create an environment in which that error is less likely or less consequential if it does occur. I just wanted to, just from my perspective, this is an important question about the relationship to, from the regulators to the regulated community. Um, the, again, there's a lot of evidence of different examples in different professions. There's been a lot of criticism of the FAA. Uh, they have come in and assured me that this, this partnership is best in this industry. I, I have a degree of skepticism to that. Um, Ideally, everybody's on the same page and wants to have safety um, with the acknowledgement that you need investments and you need shareholders. Uh, but this, is, this bill is, is not the ending, at least from our involvement, but constantly looking at how we can change this relationship. And as I said, as I said at the beginning, I'm particularly grateful for the current chair of the NTSB and his willingness to be more proactive at looking at um, the work they do. And I think the FAA is coming along that way, but I'm sure the committee uh, will continue to look at that relationship. Um, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, somebody over here. Here. Um, I was curious, two years ago when this happened at SFO, um, I know you were working on it, you went to SFO, how did you first learn about the scheduling of this incident and what was your initial reaction as a pilot to the pilot of the record? I learned about it from the lay media, as most people did, and as I began to learn more and more about it from aviation journalists and seeing uh, the initial results of the investigation of the incident, uh, I was very concerned. There are these very uh, close call, near miss events uh, every so many number, so many number of years, uh, but each time they occur, they should be uh, an alarm, uh, a, a warning to redouble our efforts to avoid complacency, to remain vigilant, and actively look out for these systemic risks before they can lead to a, an accident. Um, it, so it was a real wake-up call, I think, for the industry that this came so close. Just to give you an example uh, of how close they came, the NTSB determined after the fact, obviously, that there was only about 14 feet vertical separation between the bottom of the Air Canada jet when it reached its minimum altitude and the tail of one of the airplanes lined up for takeoff on the parallel taxiway that they lined up on. So it, uh, it could easily have been one of the worst catastrophes in the entire history of aviation on a par with the April 1977 runway collision in Tenerife of KLM and Pan Am 747s. Peter? Yes, Mr. Yes. Yes, so on the human factors, it calls for the formation of uh, this group of experts. Uh, it sets a sunset, but it also allows for an extension. So, and then reporting to the Congress. So again, the public will be involved with this, the press will be involved with it. Uh, my personal opinion, <clears throat> as I've stated before, is that we should be doing this constantly, is looking at best practices um, to make sure that we're, we're continuing to reinforce what we've already done in aviation and make it safe for the public. Good night. Again, Sully, do you have anything to add? No. Nope. Uh, I agree. <coughs> Six years. Six years. Thank you.
Is both. So it looks at best look at the, looking at what's available now and looking at what could become available. This bill was, was developed over the course of two years since the near miss here. Um, so there's more work to be done on the design side. And I don't know if, Sully, you have anything to add that might be part of this bill, but most of our focus for the last two years obviously has been in response to that near miss. And then the knowledge that we had multiple other near misses at other airports around the country. <coughs> Well, the bill has an appropriation of $20 million. So uh, much of this work is going to be funded by the taxpayers. And then we'll see um, what the cost would be. It's meant to be a very thoughtful, not an immediate answer to um, the near miss. Although just having done this and having had, had the involvement and the report from the NTSB, which this bill implements their suggestions, um, has got the attention of people. And I, these, uh, Sully could speak to that um, with more force given his experience. But we're pay the taxpayers are paying for this, and then with the expectation that some of this new technology and some of the human factors is going to be a cost incurred by others, too. Is this okay? <laughs> you're, you're being like a politician. You're, you're pushing this here. <laughs> Well, the bill actually mentions that, that we're going to talk to the international community as part of this. As we form our group here in this country, the bill requires that group to have more communication with the international aviation community. And if you wanted to add anything? Yeah. I think that's an important component. Uh, we need to have as much as possible international agreement on what the, the minimum best standard should be. Already the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, an arm of the United Nations establishes recommended practices. But I, I think this bill would encourage the kinds of conversations internationally that would help bring other international standards up near the U.S. standard in important areas. I think that would be a very desirable goal to have. Well, I want to thank you again uh, for coming. If you have any other questions, feel free to submit them. Amy can give you the contact, and we will, we will try to answer them. Thanks again to the pilots. Thank you for your career choice. <clears throat> thank you for your active engagement. And lastly, thank you to Sully. Uh, it's just been a delight working with you. Thanks, thank sir. you all. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you again. Good to meet you. Did you want to jump in? Take care. <laughs> How did we do? Did you get it right? I thought you did a great job. Okay, good. Just don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that he was yeah. shy once, too. <laughs> <laughs> He's had more practice. All right. I had to get over that. All right. Me, too.